Welcome, I'm glad to see you all and lively crew at our regular board meeting. And our first order of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. And we would invite the Kumi Elementary students to lead us, please. Ready, Ready begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, to approve the agenda as published? I'll second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 That motion passes. And right away, we'll turn it over to our Kootenai Elementary principal. Thank you, Summer Tucker, yes. and Hi. our students. Yes, Gina's on the um, so hello, yes, uh, I'm Summer Tiger, the principal at Kootenai Elementary, and today our R video team will be presenting on our PBIS program at Kootenai Elementary. So PBIS stands for Positive Behavior Intervention and Support, and it's an evidence-based uh, framework that goes through to use proactive and preventative strategies to help support positive behavior for all students. Um, so actually, um, so it's funded through the state of Idaho through ITBS, which stands for Idaho Tiered Behavior Support. Um, and so to get into a cohort, we have to submit an application process and then show that we have certain components of that program. Um, we are currently in our second year as a Tier 2 cohort. And so what that looks like is we dive in to make data-driven decisions. Um, we specifically uh, focus on our school-wide values, which they will present on in a little bit, and then acknowledge students um, for uh, following those school-wide values to help promote positive behavior school-wide. So without further ado, I would love to introduce you to our R video team. We have Beatrix Ray, we have Lucas Lohman, Elsa Gidley, and Riley Jolly. School-wide values are used everywhere we go in school. Teachers and staff teach the right way to do things, and then students get acknowledged for doing the right thing and following the school-wide values. We use our school-wide values in our classrooms, in specials, on the playground, in the cafeteria, and in our hallways. Next, we will explain what the Pirates R is and what it represents, starting with A. Always say, safe students are in control of their bodies and are aware of their surroundings at all times. They look out for each other by following school rules and making smart choices so no one gets hurt. These students create a welcoming environment where other students feel protected so everyone can focus on learning and doing their best. Some ways that I am safe at school are that I use walking feet in the hallway, I keep my hands to myself, and I wait my turn. The first R stands for respectful. Respectful students listen to adults and classmates, patiently wait their turn to speak, and use kind words and actions to show that they care about how others feel. They follow school rules and make and school rules and make the school a better place by treating others how they would want to be treated, helping create a positive learning environment for all. Ways I can be respectful is by following adults' directions, being on task, and listening to others when they are speaking, to not take things that are not mine, and to not interrupt other people. The second R stands for responsible. Responsible students follow the group plan, take care of important tasks, and make good choices that help keep our school safe, clean, and organized. These students always do their best, ask for help when they need it, and offer help to others in need. So is that I am responsible is that I help other classmates when they need help, turn my work in on time, and clean up after, clean up after myself. You might be wondering why is the Pirates are important. When we all listen and follow our school values, we can pay attention, learn better, and feel good at school. If we don't follow our school values, people could get physically hurt, get their feelings hurt, or lose trust between students and teachers. Doing the right thing makes you feel good, and it's nice to be recognized for being a role model. We have many acknowledgement systems to reward students for following our prior arts, such as our tickets. Our tickets are rewarded to students who are following prior arts. 
Our wild board is a whiteboard that students write their name on when they are following the pirate arts. Students get rewarded if they get called from the wild board or from the art plugin. We also have shoutouts and positive office referrals. Shoutouts give students an opportunity, an opportunity to reward a friend or someone they saw doing nice or kind things. Positive office referrals are shoutouts from teachers to students. All of these things are put on the daily announcements. The purpose is to make people feel special and feel good about doing the right thing. We also have quarterly R awards. These quarterly awards are given out four times each year to recognize students who have been following the pirate R's in class and around the school. Teachers nominate students for these awards and they are acknowledged to add an assembly. The final acknowledgement systems are the Crow's Nest and Dojo Coins. The Crow's Nest is a quarterly store where students can buy things with their Dojo Coins. Dojo Coins are positive points that are earned when teachers see students following the Pirates R in the classroom and around the school. This year we created the R video team to show our peers how to follow the school-wide values on our daily announcements. We had to submit applications and, our expl and explain our ideas to help improve student behavior. We all like to sprinkle in a little bit of comedy to keep the students engaged and have fun while watching the videos. One of our first videos was explaining how to use the wildboard, what not to do on the wildboard, and where the wildboard was located. Take a look at our first video.
second video was about wearing proper attire on the snow berms and the right way to play on them. Take a look at our second video. Okay, tell me you're ready. Wait, no, start it over. You gotta start it over at the same time. They're going. They're going. You gotta start it over. about uh, this kind of new wrinkle in our program. Uh, very proud to introduce to you tonight their teacher, Ms. Amanda Valera. Hey. All right, so I'm not actually going to present too much for you guys. I'm just going to introduce the kids. Uh, so we have Tyler Wood, Hank Hemstock, Sammy Leverton, uh, Taylor Bannock, Ellie Blumenberg, Carly Klippel, Tacey Tajan, Davey Lopez, and then Freya Beardy. Take it away, kiddos. Okay. So our class leadership is a group of representatives for SMS and we're working to improve both the environment for our school and our community. Throughout leadership, we have four committees, which are spirit, community, technology, and environmental. Each community works on a different aspect, creating our leadership class. On to the next slide. Our first committee is the environmental committee. Our goal is to create a better environment for our school and the communities around us. Part of our goal is redoing the planner boxes, at our school in the quad, and what our goal is to make it kind of a garden with just uh, green vegetables, just some nice fruits and vegetables, 
and we have a team of we're working on that on helping us rebuild the garden boxes. Um, we're trying to start a recycling program, so we are trying. We're looking for donations that uh, we can use that money to buy recycling bins. And our, we also want to do campus cleanups, where we go around and find trash and just clean it up to make the environment better. In spring. Okay, our technology committee is trying to make technology more accessible for students and teachers. So some of our goals right now are making it easy for Chromebooks to be charged in class because that's a big problem and it really slows down the learning process. And then creating digital content for events and activities so that everyone can like be associated with what we're doing. And making videos about like what happened. We, we call them Ready for Red and it's about like what happened in the school week. It kind of recaps on that and like sums up the week. <coughs> you guys, is this the one to skip or? We can skip it. It's just about, that one was about our food drive, which you're going to hear about from Tacey in a second anyway. So, kind of can skip that one. Community committee. Our goal as a community committee is to make SMS better involved with each other as well as the community. So far this year, we've done a food drive and we donated over 3,000 items to our local food bank. We did the veterans <coughs> assembly and we had veterans come in and do a little presentation for our whole school. Um, we are doing more school fundraisers like that and we're just doing a boys volleyball tournament which we're going to just have a bunch of boys come and do a boys volleyball tournament <laughs> um, and other school movie events to earn money for the school. <laughs> Next is the spirit committee. The goal of the spirit committee is to increase the pride of standpoint middle school students. We are cha we're creating fun events for the teachers and students and and promoting them for like to have more school spirit. Some of the events we have done is spirit weeks, dance. We had one this week but it got postponed. Pride games, kindness week, and celebrating staff birthdays. And then we also did a kindness chain which you'll hear more about from Friday. So um, in early November there was World Kindness Week and how we celebrated it at SMS was by creating Kindness Chain. Uh, so in Flex, all the students write down what they're grateful for, and, uh, and then put it on the paper. We would connect the chain and we'd like you guys to um, join us on the chain by writing what you guys We want kindness from everybody. Can I get this to you? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I like my nice Oh, actually, so on the way out, you guys, there will be a red box and you guys can put that in there. Great. By learning things, and I get to have fun with uh, the students in the class and outside. Leadership is important to me because it builds our school into a better environment, and it makes me a better leader. Leadership is important to me because I love being involved in my school and being a part of the community. Leadership is important to me because I love helping out others in our school and our community. Leadership is important to me because I have many friends and I love helping my school. Leadership is important to me because it's made me a better overall student and person. Leadership is important to me because we get to help our school and community. Leadership is important to me because I get to help out my school. 
Leadership is important to me because I get to help out my community and make our school a better place. Questions? Questions? <coughs> questions. Hmm. I hate to sound like a broken record, but what grade is anyone in? Eight. So eight. eight. Everybody's eight. Yeah. 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 Okay. So can I ask a question of a particular student? Yeah, let's get started. Uh -oh. <laughs> How do you know about your job? Frey, how does it feel to have won third place in math counts today? Uh, yeah, of the, all the students there, we somehow were able to make it third even with one day of practice. Yeah. You yeah. yeah. guys don't know, <laughs> Trustee Sherman took that out as a volunteer for our school and we formed a team. Thursday. Thursday. <laughs> and took them down because we had some turnover in our math department. We didn't have somebody who was doing math counts, and she took it on, brought a team down, and kind of crushed it. And that teammate took individual one of the top ten. That's awesome. Woo! We picked a very good day to not be in school. Yeah. <laughs> nice job, all of you. Thank you for your leadership. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Outstanding. So, folks, uh, uh, please do give us your your add to our kindness chain because we always want our community to extend beyond our four walls of our school and into the community so write down what you're grateful for put it in the box in the back on your way out at the end of the meeting or whenever and let's give a big hand to our leadership students because it's a busy meeting. Uh, this reporting for January, generally in January, we'd actually have a big number next to how much we collected in our supplemental levy. It's only 303,000. That's because the check that came from Bonner County was just, just came at the start of February instead of the end of January, so it didn't post. But that is like nearly $7.2 million that actually we have. So next month you'll see that big spike. Um, so if you look at compare from year to date and the revenues at the bottom there, you know, we're at 55% where last year and the year yeah. before we're like at 70, well that's why. Yeah. It's, it's just a timing issue. Um, expenditures, again, we're tracking in the general fund, right where we've been doing right around $3.1 million for salaries and benefits each month. So that's pretty consistent through the end of the year. Um, we're really, <clears throat> nothing is a big surprise so far this year. February 15th, so tomorrow, we'll actually get our apportionment report, report from the state as far as where our true attendance is and how much, how many funding units we generated and how that relates to dollars. Um, so we'll have a lot more clarity of how we're tracking for the rest of the year. Really, this time of year, you get a lot of information. So that's good. The next are just our two charts to sort of show you how we're coming along the expenditure side we're almost halfway through the year fiscally not quite but you can see our expenditures are right there about halfway going up and if we look at the revenues definitely our state apportionment that's going to go up even a little bit more when we get our February payment 
And of course, that supplemental levy line will be over halfway up um, next right. month when you see it. So things are looking good. Enrollment, actually, when you think about it, we were down about 100 kids comparing to last year, and we've held on to the kids pretty good this year. And so we're down 23 year to year comparison, uh, and up 12 from last month. So, you know, as far as keeping the kids in enrollment, that's been pretty steady since the sort of the initial unexpected drop at the start of the year. So that's good news. So one thing I did want to talk about, there, there's a lot going on in the legislature right now. Summer is going with the funding formula may change a little bit. But this is the big school facilities bill, and I didn't want to talk about both because they, they get sort of complicated. So this, at least I think I could address and give you some information <coughs> on if it passes. So it dedicates $125 million of sales tax revenue to the school modernization fund. And that'd be $125 million every year for 10 years, I think, is what they're planning. That would be, he was talking $2 billion. I'm not sure if that incomplete, maybe it's, it's going to go longer, but that's at least the initial year. And so <clears throat> they would give us the dollars by just sort of right uh, by attendance. And so if you look at the state, we're about 1.22% of the statewide attendance, Lake Ponderé. So that would be our kind of the pot. So effectively, about $1.5 million a year. We wouldn't know till every year, but still, that's. Um, not insignificant, especially if it happened for 10 years in a row, in $15 million. Um, it authorized at the state level that we could actually have an, a bond issued and get all the money up front, like the $15 million up front. <clears throat> They'd issue a bond. And then we could draw down, you know, those 10 years of appropriation. The, the caveat I didn't have there uh, is language, but if for some reason the funding didn't happen, let's say, in year seven, because it's, it's sort of an annual appropriation, yep. then you would have to take that 1.5 from operating somewhere else, because that is, will be a number one bill you'd have to pay. So that that would be sort of a risk if you did that, but I think they'd have a commitment to keep the program going if they started it. Um, you have to have a 10-year maintenance plan submitted, similar to the 10-year maintenance plans we, we submit now, so I don't think that's a, a huge lift. It might have a few new requirements. Um, establishes a model school facilities council to establish a building standard, like a standard elementary school across the state. Um, I think that that's fine. I think that's difficult when you get to different sites, different locations, different enrollments. Um, plans, different permitting agency, that, but um, it might have you a, a good place to start with plans and help you ex expedite the process. Um, other things that the legislation does, so it, it, it's a, over a 30 page bill. Wow. So there's a lot of language. It would remove the August election date. So we would only have May and November. It repeals bond levy equalization, which doesn't affect Lake Pond Array because we don't have a bond. Um, but when I was at Coeur d'Alene and Lakewood, we both had bonds and the state helped pay a little bit of our bond payments with this fund. So this, that'd be some revenues they're gonna do to help pay for this. Um, adds plant facilities levies as eligible levies for last year's property tax reduction. There was, it's cleaning up language. We don't have a plant facility levy, so it doesn't really impact us. But if we did, it would impact the way that um, we wouldn't collect those dollars from the locals until they get the property tax relief and how that would figure out. Interesting enough, it has language that would limit a district going to a four-day school week in 2024. So like if you're currently like Bonners Ferry, they're on a four-day week right now. They're um, grandfathered in. But if you wanted to say, go next year, you would not be eligible for some of these dollars. Mm -hmm. It's sort of the language in it. Um, some of this could change. This is the first mm -hmm. they're going through the uh, legislation now. Um, bill changes how the state board president and executive director appointed. And then uh, it actually has a provision to reduce the 
based income tax rate. So so to lower that. We also would not get, um, currently we now get like school lottery money. That we have to report later that we spent on facilities. That gets rolled into that and that's about $350,000. So there is, there's some pluses and minuses. But overall, it definitely is a, you know, the biggest sort of pro-facility legislation that's come out yep. from the legislature, um, ever from the state since they really have not had any significant dollars, you know, something like this. So it certainly would be helpful for um, many districts and, and us in the past. And we still, this would be above and beyond the dollars we're getting from House Bill 292 and their property tax reduction. So we would have some more resources for this if this ends up passing. Great. Finally, item to note, we did purchase our second activity bus. Figure out to show it. Um, sort of a crazy week, so that's good. Um, it's not on the road yet because we have to get it licensed. But um, definitely that's been really good for Clark Fork and trying to get some of the events. And Sandpoint High wants to use more use in the Probably actually need a third one, but we won't get that one next year. Great. Cool. And if any questions. Thank you very much. So we will introduce the uh, Director of Secondary Education, Ms. McLaughlin, is coming up to talk about our Social Studies curriculum update. Welcome. Take two minutes, sorry. No worries. I'm just going to you don't need to do First, thank you very much to the board um, for approving that we would, for the middle school to seek a curriculum advisory committee uh, and to do a pilot on social studies this year. So we've been busy doing that all year. Uh, so far, we've, we've, you can jump to the next slide. Um, we've had a chance to, to pilot a couple different curriculums and I'll go through that right now. But where we started in the process was we put together a group of actually every, every teacher from the middle school plus patrons and some parents. So we have, we've got an equal group of four patrons and parents and four teachers. And we went through and we talked about first what we had to do to, to make sure that we were finding the correct curriculum. The first thing we started with, of course, is the Idaho State Standards. And you can see the state standards are, they've got five different categories there, but they go through history, geography, economics, civics and government, and global perspectives. The next step of that is we look at the state list and we look at what um, the Idaho, what Idaho State has actually approved in terms of curriculum. And so there's a number of different things. And of course, at seventh grade, we teach world history. And at eighth grade, we are teaching US history. So US history A, so the first part of US history, um, pretty much runs from discovery all the way, it's a new long time span, but all the way through the Civil War and then into Reconstruction. So we entertained some different vendors that were, of course, on the state approved list. Uh, there were three different vendors that we had uh, present to us. Of those, we had HMH, their U.S. History and World Cultures. We had Cengage, uh, U.S. History and World Cultures. And we also had Savas, U.S. History and World Cultures. <coughs> the group chose out of those three to go with uh, HMH to pilot that uh, first quarter and then to pilot Cengage in the second quarter. And then we also are currently looking at a supplemental from Hillsdale 1776 curriculum and that's something that we are doing currently right now. So we can jump to the last one. Uh, so to make an objective decision is really important to us and to make sure that we are making a decision that is based on um, really how strong that program is in terms of curriculum and on all different sorts of factors. So those factors, we have a rubric uh, and I did attach that rubric so if you want to see that at some point you can go into your board report and take a look at that. Um, but it goes through these, dip, these six different uh, aspects. One is alignment and accuracy. Then we have program organization. And this is really a piece that the teachers care quite a bit about to make sure that it's user friendly. Uh, assessment is a big part of it. Uh, how are the, uh, is the assessment, are the tests and quizzes, are they linked to everything the students are learning to make sure that is, that's in line. Universal access for all students. So the student struggles, uh, maybe there's dyslexia issues or different things, but there's access for that student as well. 
and then scaffolding and support for students and usability. So there's, there's several different factors that we look at, and then we rank each of those factors. So, so far, we have looked at uh, HMH and Cengage. Now, we have already scored <coughs> HMH, and I, unfortunately, I hate to say, but did not get grade marks from our, um, and you can, you'll have a chance to look at that. It's also attached to the board report. But the feedback survey came back, and I just had the parents and teachers do the survey at the end. Um, but their rubrics came back pretty well. And they were, they were frustrated by several different things, especially the assessment piece, program organization. They just felt like the curriculum wasn't simple for students, and we had students take a survey as well, and the students did not reflect on that, that curriculum very well. Luckily, uh, luckily so far, and we'll see, uh, we are actually going to score this. It's gonna to be tomorrow, we're gonna to move it to Thursday. But we are going to score the Cengage curriculum. And so far from what I've gotten anecdotally, so far that, that information has been positive, so we'll see. Uh, and then currently for the third quarter, the US history of the eighth grade group is piloting and using the Hillsdale 1776 curriculum. And so they're utilizing that right now. Um, and they had just finished the same page for the second quarter. So that's where we're at in terms of the Social Studies Adoption Committee. I want to thank the board. Um, hopefully we're coming to a conclusion pretty quickly. If not, we'll be a little bit back to the drawing board if they come back and say, parents and patrons and teachers say, you know what, we really don't think Cengage is it either. We're gonna be back to the drawing board a little bit and probably entertain more vendors. And so that's really where we're at. Um, right, we'll be entertaining questions. Timing-wise, there's still plenty of time to order curriculum materials. Yeah, so there is. It gets it gets a little bit tight, right, toward the end here. So that's why we try to at least get two in by the time the second quarter is done. And so we're on our third. But the third is a supplemental because it does not have world history. Yeah. So the third would be a supplemental anyway, which could be adopted along with one of the others. Um, so that could happen regardless. But we're we're kind of at that spot where you, it gets a little tight. We could order one more and squeeze that in and then extend the deadline a little bit. And so that, that can certainly happen. That's why we're pushing this pretty pretty soon to score that, the SIN gauge, and just uh, on Thursday. It was gonna yeah. be tomorrow, and these issues with Sanford Middle School, so we had to push it back because it's the teachers there. So um, we'll score that, we'll see where we're at, and then we'll make adjustments. So. Are there other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. And I guess stay right here, and yep. we will invite up the Director of Elementary Education, Andrew Murray, and together you'll present for Academic Data Overview. Good evening. We are thrilled to be here just highlighting a few nuggets of our winter um, growth and all the gains that we've made in student learning thus far. So first, um, the board knows we take the Idaho Reading Indicator. That's our reading assessment statewide in kindergarten through third grade. One of the things we just wanted to highlight was the growth from fall to winter, you'll see at all of our grade levels the green growing, so those are our on-level or proficient readers. Um, also pretty significant is the shrinking of the red, so our most intensive readers <coughs> shrinking. Um, our goal as a district is always to be over 70%, close to 75 by year end, and you'll see two of our grade levels already at 71 and 73% by the winter mark, so we are just thrilled um, with that growth. The next slide um, just continues to show you one more report about the Idaho Reading Indicator. Tier 1 students would be considered your on-level readers. Um, tier 2 meaning strategic, they need a bit of a double dose. Tier 3 intensive, um, meaning the most reading support. But at all three tiers district-wide, students are showing high rate of improvement. So that was really a celebration district-wide. Next, we take the MAP assessment, you know that is measurement of academic progress, and we check in um, across both subject areas in the winter. And again, huge celebrations here across third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. This report kind of sets the diamond as to where the projection would be based on where students started. The bar graph is actual LPOSD performance. So you can see that our students exceeded those projections at almost every grade level, and the growth this year winter exceeded last year's winter in every single grade level in reading. So again, third grade is an example. Last year, 53% of our students met their goal by winter. This year, that's up to 67%. So that was also an extremely promising trend um, across elementary reading. So and I will just say as clarification, we tend to see 50%, 60 to 7% as flunking. 
this is a growth indicator, meaning this is the movement from where you started to the next spot. So anything over 50% is a celebration. I just am trying to Thank you. get it in our heads correctly that we're yes. seeing really positive numbers there. Yes. I have a question. Yes. If I could. Uh, and the, the way you score them hasn't changed from last year to this year? It hasn't gotten like more soft and that's reflective? Correct. It's, like, it's all computer-based. It's a computer-based okay. adaptive assessment. So correct. Cool. And the larger celebration is actually the next slide in mathematics. Uh, thanks to your support, you know, we purchased and implemented a brand new elementary math curriculum and those gains even further exceeded last year at this time. So highlighting again, just third grade there. Last year, um, only 40% of our students met their winter projection. This year, up to 68%. And so in talking to some of the principals, the teachers, our district-wide team, they're working really hard to implement that new curriculum that you supported. Our teachers meet in PLCs to plan and do more formative monitoring, and the, the results are just incredible at this point in time. In elementary mathematics, so again, up from 41 to 55, 52 to 64, and then sixth grade had the big ideas update um, a new version of that curriculum. They also outpaced last year at this time. So just a huge thank you to our administrative team, the principals, uh, our hardworking staff. The data looks really exciting at winter across elementary as well as secondary. <laughs> so secondary take this on a little bit differently just because we receive mid-year data uh, quite a bit different than the elementary schools but I took it school by school just to show some of the goals that each school had committed to at the beginning of the year and so I picked some different things and the principals helped me out with that uh, there are several goals I'm reporting on on one for each school one of the things that Clark Fork had committed to was uh, this idea that the, the state legislator had put out for self-directed learners and the self-directed learner plan and the idea was that we could individualize the learning plan for students at Clark Fork High School. And in doing so, allow students who are excelling to do internships, or students that are even juniors and seniors to do internships and, and things that would actually take them out of the school at times. In this case, one of the things that, that Clark Fork had done in the leadership of Mr. Kimmick uh, was to use this program to encourage students that if you are, if you have A's and B's, there are three criteria, if you had A's and B's, if you were, your attendance was, was high and your behavior was strong, then Fridays were a day where you could just come in and you could get help and remediation. You weren't committed to do the regular school day or you could do some different things like go to an internship or you could go, I know Mr. Kimmick has taken a group up skiing. And so there's some different opportunities on Fridays. This has yielded some huge results, which is pretty exciting. So the 92 students, there's 130 students total at, at uh, Clark Fork but 92 of them are high school students. So of those students, 48 qualified for this with their behavior, their attendance, and with A's and B's. Uh, 48 qualified by the end of the semester, 44 remained. And so what that tells you is the four students that didn't remain, one actually moved, and three of them were actually brought back because their grades had started to slip because they didn't have that Friday and they weren't on uh, necessarily getting everything out of the program, so they brought them back kept them going so you can go to the next slide and so what's exciting about this is you really have seen the attendance rate jump up to really the pre-covid numbers um, for the month of january it's a slight increase every month it's motivating students uh, we've also seen an increase in students passing classes only there's been only 20 f's reported on report cards among the entire student body for the first semester and when you do the math on the total courses with all of the students 780 courses which is pretty exciting um, and that's the fewest number of F's in 20 years so pretty great uh, and I just want to share a quick little story but Friday support extension time uh, Mr. McDonald out there uh, Casey he's the AD and assistant principal he shared a story that with his leadership team most of them qualify for this program and don't have to come back on every Friday however what they started to do was started to help middle school students the junior high students and that's drawing the kids back they're choosing to come back and so the goal in the first place when Mr. Kimmick and I talked about this last year was hey we want to have programs on Fridays that even though a student wouldn't have to show up they still do that's the kind of programs we want to have and that's what we're seeing take place at Clark Fork so it's really really exciting there um, so Lake Ponderay High School uh, really exciting in terms of communication. Lake Pond Pondery High School is a new principal. 
uh, Mr. Childers, and he really wanted to point out the idea that LPOHS has logged over 460 parent contacts over the first semester, with 37% of them being positive contacts. That's great. If you know LPOHS, it is an alternative high school. It's a really big deal when those kids get a positive call home, because typically that is the only positive call that they have ever gotten home. And that is the truth, that they often are students who go to that school who have never gotten those positive calls. So that was one of the goals that we set out in the beginning of the year uh, with Mr. Childers and for LPOHS. And it's really great to see that they are meeting that goal and exceeding that goal. Sandpoint Middle School, one of the goals that they chose was to, to look at Live School. Live School is an online positive behavior uh, system at Sandpoint Middle School. And it really supports the idea of catching students being good. Let's see what students are doing and let's just catch them being good. And students can earn recognition for just doing the right thing. So they earn points for that. And you can see the different top <coughs> positive uh, behaviors that have been recognized. So engaging with lessons, staying on task, being on time, coming prepared, sticking with it, uh, participating in discussions, striving for excellence, showing a growth mindset, respecting staff, showing kindness, and there's more. But the idea is with middle schoolers and as a former middle school principal, you really do need to emphasize how are we going to get these students to buy in? What are they doing that we can support them in their positive, their positive relationships with other students and with staff and with people and with things like sticking to it? Uh, those, are, those are really exciting numbers there. The last one to point out is Sandpoint High School, their growth data. You can look on the left, you can look at the, the prior stats from last year versus the statistics from this year. One of their, they have two, they had two big goals this year. There's several more, but two of them were absences and the F list, right? How many students are actually failing classes at the quarter and at the semester? And so if you look at the fall 22 quarter one statistics, there were 4,848 days missed. That's a lot of days by students. That's roughly 4.5 missed days per student last year in the first quarter. That is 90% ADA. It's not great. Because of that, well, partially because of that, um, one of the factors was the F list was at 842 Fs on quarter one report card. Now you fast forward to this, the first quarter of this year, absences, 1,581 days missed, 96% ADA, and roughly 1.5 missed days per student. And I completely attribute that to the hard work that uh, Mrs. Crossingham, to Mrs. Grenier, to the whole entire admin group is doing there. Uh, it, it's pretty impressive. So, uh, and if you look, right, cut that F list in half because of that. And then you look at, at semester statistics, also excellent in comparison, went from 89.3% ADA to 95.5%, and an average student absence about 115 students per day to 45 per day. Uh, and the F list has shrunk almost a half from 448 Fs on semester one report card to 280 Fs on semester one report card. And they continue to improve. It's exciting to see what they're doing both academically with their goals, which of course contributes to this, but also the fact that they've put such an emphasis on being in school. Um, and it's exciting to see. So ultimately we want to say thank you to the board. We want to say thank you um, obviously to our administrators as well and take any questions. But thanks for supporting our students. It's pretty exciting to see the growth that our schools are having and the high goals that they're setting for themselves and of course achieving and carrying out. Are there questions for the trustees? Yeah, other than the diff, the, the new admin that's at the at Sandpoint High School, yeah. what what changes were implemented to come up with those numbers that are well I will tell you what the attendance protocols that they are carrying out, they are having personal phone calls. Um, we have a person, Mr. Pollack, who is going personally to people's homes and knocking on doors. Um, we have, uh, what's, it's, what's it really incredible, and just last week, uh, Mr. Crossingham and Mr. Taylor, who's new, the new admin there, took us through their spreadsheet that they created. And Ms. Grenier was talking about that spreadsheet and showing just how organized they are with every single thing in terms of absences and tardies and where students are at and struggling and they can actually it's manageable right they figured out a system to make it manageable and then actually have personal calls and personal contact with these, with these students which is light years from right when you have thousand over a thousand students it's hard to keep track 
909, 500 students at Central Middle School. It was hard. Those numbers come in fast. And it's hard to make those phone calls. They've created a system, and, and it's it's pretty awesome. On top of that, of course, you know, grade wise, they have they have goals for grades and for check ins and for different things as well, which I think is also contributing. It's not one single isolated factor. There's multiple factors. And bulldog times. Oh yeah, bulldog times another one. They have time to carve out in their schedule. Um, to reteach for students who are struggling, they have a time dedicated that students can come back in and get reteaching opportunities, which is huge. That's a big, big thing. That's great. Are there any other questions? Thank you for your presentation. Thank you so Thank much, you. guys. And you're up. Superintendent Dr. Becky Meyer is giving us a superintendent. Yeah. Reminding people of our strategic plan and our goal for connection this year. Uh, first one is apropos today addressing facilities. So just give you an update for the Sandpoint Middle School facility update. So these are just two um, showing you where it was coming out how it, it you know looked to Jim when he first arrived, the head custodian, and then just looking at that, you can see it's still dark outside. Um, really what happened is the insulation uh, was up in there, contained, undisturbed, and it once the leak came out, then they had to open it up to look for the leak. Uh, it, we sealed off just to be on the safe side. I asked that we sealed off the entire hallway, that entire, so that whole, Part of the building was um, we had the screen duct tape it up and sealed it off so that it what the staff and students weren't exposed we redistributed so the classroom mr. Penrose did a, a, an excellent job he uh, and, and mr. Tajan had to redistribute all of those classrooms back to the other hallway um, took a lot of work um, and they were doing it up to the very minute that school started and then we had Mr. Polinick and a couple of Sandpoint um, <coughs> High School people, adults that could help escort. Uh, we had the, the water was off in their testing, then the water went back on, but then it started to leak again, so we had to turn the water back off. Um, thinking that it could be just a today problem, we did escorting to the restrooms instead of getting um, porta potties for the school. We put in for expedited testing, so we sent in the testing today. We're not sure how long that will take. I'm hoping it comes in the next day or two. But we did send out the schedule, which I shared with the board and the middle school and high school parents, that the next schedule, the middle school students will have remote learning. Schoology, Mr. Penrose will be meeting with the staff. And then we worked all day to come up with schedules and how to put uh, Sandpoint Middle School students into the high school to create you know, when science can go to science, art can go to art. Um, and so we have some contingency plans, uh, and then we have the next two days, then there's no school on Friday and no school on Monday. So we have a little bit of time. Hopefully that will come back, um, and then we'll go from there. So uh, if it is a negative result, uh, we can move back in. I have asked for a certificate that it's able to be occupied. I want to make sure that we can tell, I want, a certified person to be able to tell us that we can put students and staff back in Sandpoint Middle School. Uh, we've already, this is our second major issue this year, uh, and I, I just want to make sure it's safe for families to send their kids. So we have worked on several contingency plans, um, and we have some of those. We've spent all day, we didn't do anything else today except for trying to figure out how um, we could help the situation. But we do have a plan for tomorrow and Thursday, and then we've bought ourselves some time to get to the next week. So I should know more tomorrow and I will uh, update the board and the families. Um, unfortunate, especially with their dance, Valentine's Day dance, I think kids were most disappointed about that. I'm sure. So. I'm sure. But kudos to you and everybody who spent all day and will over the next yeah. five days resolving. Yeah. Situation. It really is, and the middle school staff was so flexible. It was amazing to see. I mean, if you listen to Mr. Penrose's voice announcement that went out, um, I really appreciate his communication because he takes the time to do that voicemail as well and give everybody, you know, people can be driving and listen versus having to look at their text, which 
uh, it's probably saving car crashes too. Uh, I really like the fact that that staff is so flexible. I mean, they just, okay, we can go there helping kids, sending the high school was super flexible. Their admin was on duty all day helping with, with that as well. So uh, the next two days will be different, um, but we should know more tomorrow and then we'll do um, get to, into the next plan, CDE, if we need to. Any questions on that? Um, Okay, um, this is our committee work. We will, will be at Lake Pondre High School this, this month for our meeting and we're gonna start to do some prioritizing and they're gonna start to, we're almost getting to the end of our tours and we'll be prioritizing, looking at systems and then what they think, um, obviously the middle school will add on another layer of what we've already been discussing um, with the Long Range Facility Planning Committee. Uh, student safety, I just want to remind you, I have told you in the board update, uh, we are having it Wednesday, April 17th, 5.30 at Sandpoint High School. All the school counselors, school administrators will be there. Our, a our security officers, our district safety task force team will be there. We are going to invite West Bonner and uh, Boundary County families and all the private and Christian schools in town. There's just so much going on for student safety. Um, really important to me I really don't know if parents know what's going on um, there's it, the out the, the flyer that's coming out even says the word sextortion I didn't even I mean that's a new word to me but that's things that are happening online with families and that they in our area that families don't know about it was new information to me um, my three girls are all graduated you know from, from college undergraduate college now but it, it's something I think parents really need to be a, a, a lot aware of. Them drugs in our community, and you know the fentanyl, and we sent out from Officer Little that information to Sandpoint High School families, and we're going, we really feel like all families in the area need to know what's, what's in our community, and we just want to make people aware. So we're having this um, Student Safety Summit. Uh, I'm having the Panhandle Health Department for Opioid Recovery cell phones. They're going to pay for child care and provide a sandwich dinner for folks so that people can come straight from work, come to this, and be able to listen to the information. Um, I have experts that are presenting. I had written down that we were invited to attend. Yes, you, I, I've yes. asked you guys in the I last three time. weeks, I've said, please put this in your calendar. I really want you guys to be there. Okay. Um, yeah, we have an expert on the uh, from the ISP about fentanyl and other drugs in our community. <laughs> Um, we did have a death of a student the year before I got here, so it is close to the heart of a lot of people in this community. And then we did have a, um, a student issue that I want you to know about with some online things. We have an um, Idaho Crimes Against Children task force member that's going to be here and juvenile probation uh, supervisor. They, and I've seen their presentation and they're going to be presenting as well. All the counselors will be there. We're going to have parents be able to boot anonymous questions to ask so they don't have to ask it in front of the group. So that will start at 5.30. I would love it if everyone could be there. Um, improving the student connection. I just want to remind everyone this is CTE month. And a special shout out to Sandpoint Middle School. Amanda Johnson is teaching uh, career exploration. It's brand new by law this year. We need to do it. But these are some pictures of students. Um, and just really want to thank all the CTE instructors, uh, hands on really high in student engagement and hopefully we'll be moving even more into the CTE uh, environment. Hopefully we'll find out on Friday. So. Uh, again with the one trusted adult I try to point out some school each month that um, some growth that they've made in the mid-year report from Washington Elementary we just met with all principals for their mid-year data report. I had the last one this morning was saying well I had to cancel because of this morning's thing, so we'll have to, she's the last one I have to do is Sagal, but a shout out to uh, Tasha, who's actually standing in the back there, and her um, major report, they only have one student left um, to make a connection with, so that's pretty amazing when she has 300 and some students. 29. 329. He was on vacation. <laughs> yeah. And he was on vacation, thank you. So they have one student left, it's, it's pretty impressive. Increased student students, I won't go into this because Mr. McLaughlin already talked about this at Sandpoint High School. Um, it really is a greater focus this year, not just at Sandpoint High School, but all of our students at our new attendance protocol that you all approved um, with the, new, the board policy and the protocol. So for quality staff, just a reminder about our wellness program. 
and just getting uh, groups of employees to actually get out there and get some. It's hard in the winter with the seasonal weather that we have and the grayness and getting out and doing things, but it's really been motivational to be able to have them do that. So thank you to that committee and uh, Joy and her team, the staff wellness program are in charge of that. And then for the community connection, we have Annie, if you could just wave. Annie is our uh, new community relations liaison and a big thank you to Kristen for everything that she has done uh, over the last two years. It's been amazing. She's got a great foundation and Annie will be um, taking her place. So welcome to her. Uh, there is the loop and you can link into the January loop there. It's in the bottom um, if, if you want to do that. Casey and Andrew already covered our student learning at the center of all we do. Uh, any questions? I talked kind of fast because that was wow, exceptionally quick. That was good. Yeah. Are there any questions from the trustees? No. Thank you very much, Dr. Meyer. And again, we appreciate uh, not only your work, but everybody <coughs> pulled together at the middle school today. So we will move on. We have public comment. And the first is Jen McKnight. I will just start by saying the Board of Trustees welcomes patron comments from the community. Comments are limited to three minutes per person, must be appropriate for open forum. Input must not identify individual personnel or students or be abusive, defamatory, or seen. This is a board meeting in, uh, held in public, not a public board meeting, as governed by Idaho Code 33, Section 5. Thus, no discussions or responses can occur during the meeting. Issues may be referred to the proper staff person or committee for follow-up by the board's discretion. Any complaint about the district, including instruction discipline, district personnel policy, procedure, or curriculum should be referred through proper administrative channels before it's presented to the board. And go ahead, Jen. Welcome. <coughs> that was good news about um, getting those Fs down in the park work. Um, it's hard to pinpoint where something starts. It might have been the anti-bullying campaign 15 or 20 years ago, or the zero tolerance for fighting initiative like 25 years ago. I don't think either of these programs were about the bully. I think they were meant to squash the people who would fight back, people like me. Bullies didn't go away, they got bigger and more organized. School bullies are the people at the top. And their great tool is using lying phraseology with everything they do. Underground kindness, sources of strength, one, one trusted adult. So these initiatives come in with their friendly names and the schools bring in puppies. And kids are told that anything they do is equally a good idea and give them blanket empty compliments while being given a worse and worse education. They are given more fun classes, while more serious ones and more time and serious academic classes are phased out. When we come to these meetings, we hear a lot of, um, a lot of focus on social emotional, and we don't hear things about trying to improve class sizes and, and math and, and all those other classes that kids probably need more attention to to really perform highly in. I don't think those at the top under prioritize, I don't think they under prioritize academic success of students. I think they are purposefully raising an undereducated, docile generation. I do not know to what specific purpose. My guess would be for some type of enslavement. This probably sounds mean and crazy but the facts are there. The fun classes and the puppies are there. The low academic achievement is there. We have lying, nice oppressors colliding with our own laziness. It's a cold war. Thank you. And we have one other public comment from Dean Cannon. Welcome. Thanks, everyone. This is regarding patient complaint. And one of the things I appreciate about the uh, request for review process is it kind of opens it up. 
um, basically I get to solicit the board's attention to something that um, the district uh, may have passed on or, or uh, felt that they've dealt with. Uh, this November, at a United Against Hate event, an FBI public information officer was asked that the local uh, task forces meet monthly with the FBI. The FBI agent's answer to this question was, no comment. No comment. So I'd like to read a quote here. All tyranny needs to gain a foothold is for people of good conscience to remain silent. There's kind of a disease of silence in our country right now. And it happens because of cancel culture. And people don't feel they can speak because they're going to lose their job. You know, they're going to lose their, you know, they can lose everything in cancel culture. And how do groups like uh, Moms for Liberty or Parents Rights Idaho or Read Out News, how do they end up on the SPLC hate map? And if you're on the hate map, uh, TSA no fly list, can't check into certain hotels, you get debanked, pretty much cancels your life. How do they get that information? I think they get it from questions like this, which is Bonner County Human Rights Task Force scholarship question. It says to high school students or middle school students, what significant human rights issues exist in your school, in your community? Frankly, I think this is none of their business. Uh, this is a very different question from what have you done for human rights or uh, what do human rights mean to you? You know, that's a question kind of soliciting character. And the, the former is one soliciting information, possibly intelligence. So I filed a complaint about it. And my question for them was, is there any communication whatsoever, directly or indirectly, between Bonner County Human Rights Task Force and FBI, DOJ, DHS, SPLC, and ADL? The second part of that question was, does Bonner County Human Rights Task Force contribute in any way to the SPLC's intelligence project, which creates their hate map? It used to be called Clan Watch. So, groups like Moms for Liberty are on something that used to be called Clan Watch, but they changed it to the hate map. So, this question was not answered by them. I got something about they shred the applications, and that's great, but you, you can't shred information from memory. So, whatever information is gleaned uh, from these applications, um, these task force organizations are obligated to report significant human rights issues uh, to federal agencies. It says so on their website. So, if they're obligated to report these issues, you know, what are they doing asking kids about them? And I wanted to ask them. They can say yes, they do have a relationship with them, they do not, they can tell me to pound sand. I just wanted an answer, and uh, I'd appreciate it if the board could take this up and just get an answer, and I would appreciate it. It's, uh, it's you know, yes, no, or maybe from them, uh, but so far, uh, it's nothing. So, is that the three minutes? That yeah. was. It was. All right. All right. All right. All right. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We will move on to first reading of policy. We have two of them, and the first is policy 2385, which is English Learners Program. This is a new policy. <laughs> Sorry, this is um, in our Title I uh, in federal programs review. We needed to have this policy. So Dr. Joy Jansen um, is here if you have any questions. She and um, her team put this together. And then, um, which, well, I'll tell you. Okay. Um, so just first off, were there any questions that trustees had for either Dr. Meyer or Dr. Jansen regarding the need for it and the language? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Was there something no. in place prior to this or just... This, no, this is the first, that, this is the first one, yes. This and yeah, she uncovered this during the federal review. Uh, yeah, dictated by the legislature. Okay. 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 Um, so this is based on federal? Uh, title I, uh, Title I, Title II, yeah. Title IV B, Title V, Part B. It's all of the federal programs that um, Dr. Jansen mm -hmm. is And it's specifically um, geared toward those English language learners. Yeah. So we have like a policy for our pay mentor, which is our homeless. So but we do not have a policy on this is what we have So we can help Right. Were there any 
language concerns that you saw. I did have a question, sort of a sidebar, but sure. do you guys know off the top of your head how many students impact are impacted here as a English language learner? Seven. I think it's seven. Ish. That's close enough. It's dropped massively the last two years, but oh, okay. so I don't know the exact number. Yeah. It's okay. I, I sort of wanted a ballpark where we talk, you know, no. that's close enough. It's under two. We, yeah, under two. This is, of course, the first reading, which is your opportunity to raise any questions. We'll have it come back for a second reading and, and approval, so there's no motion on this today. I have a you have a question? So, Go ahead. I'm assuming that, like, the verbiage in here is gleaned from mall policy. Yes. <coughs> I just saw Okay. I saw dominant but, language, and I was just like, is that? Oh, they, yeah. They, that'll be called. So, one of my questions was, as you formulated this, did it, it already sort of align with what we were doing? With that? That's what, I, when I read this, I thought. It's probably already what we're doing now. It's in policy to um, make it official and bring it in alignment. So there's no other questions on this one. I'm getting a lot of nods. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> we, we. So this next one. Um, is a delete and everything that's covered you can see the last time this was actually looked at and we are going to be going through uh, Mr. McLaughlin is going to be having ankle surgery soon you probably saw him with his crutches and he's already talked to you about that he's going to be working on the policy so you will see more policies coming here he's agreed to read through every it's very tedious work. <laughs> so he's going to start. I'm just letting you know. I'm giving you a heads up. This is the first one we did based on getting the ELP program, the English language program. That we policy made us read this one, which then said this is out of date. So this one is already being covered in our other policies. So we're going to start at the thousands, and we're going to be going through and looking at all of our old policies. Do they need to be? updated, deleted, or we already covered them in a new policy. That's a system yeah. that we haven't done in a while. And uh, pre-COVID, Kelly said, so we're going to start doing that methodically to the start. Yep. He, he's <laughs> happy to do it. <laughs> yeah. So um, you'll notice that these policy numbers replace each other even though they are not, right. it's not like renewing that policy. It's a totally different Yeah, policy. And that's what the other model policy has this number, so that's how we even looked at that's it. Number. Is there any other questions for Dr. Meyer or anyone on that deleted policy? Okay. That is first reading of both of those policies, which are the same policy. And we'll go on. I will hear a motion for consent agenda. I make the motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 That motion passes. We have a number of action items, and the first is the off-site prom request from Sandpoint High School. She's not she was still in treatment. I see her. Yeah. She thought we were never going to get to her. She <laughs> left in despair. So we have a Sandpoint High School representative here. And welcome. Hey. Ran in right on time. <laughs> Okay. Hello, Board of Trustees. My name is Taylor Grenier, and I'm the president of Sandpoint High School's senior class of 2024. I'm here today to request to have an off-site prom at the Hartwood Center, which is on Oak Street, and that's across from Evans Brothers. Um, the class of 2023 used this property last year, and um, it revealed that it was an excellent location. Uh, we chose this venue because of the convenience of the location, the venue's capacity, and the ADA compliance. Um, after talking with administration, they also included that they were super impressed with the safety and the security of the venue as well. Um, the parking for students will be in the surrounding side streets and the city parking lots. Um, the rental cost will be $1,250, and that's $800 for the main hall and an extra 450 for the Grove, but that will all be paid for by the class of 2024. Um, so thank you for taking the time, and I look forward to your consideration and approval, and 
if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Usually a team comes from the school. You just have to do it yourself. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was a shocker. <laughs> was there a rock, rock, paper, scissors that you guys had to get? Well, yeah, I am the president. She's the president. The president. The president. Well, there you go. Yeah. So um, it was held there last year. I remember we approved it. And I, are there any questions? So I will entertain a motion to approve the offsite. Motion. I will make a motion to approve the offsite form request for sampling. I second. And seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. So Thank you, much. Brave Soul. Yes, be safe at home. So um, we have next, we have a request for review. And you have this, it was uh, information in your packets. I hope everyone had a chance to review this before we, we uh, dive into it. So a request for review happens after there has been a patron complaint. It has gone through the process, um, has been processed and handled at the superintendent level. It now comes before the board for review. That's what we're looking at tonight. And um, in your packet, there was some information from policy 4110, which helps you understand the board's responsibility in a uh, patron complaint when it gets to that uh, request for review phase and um, if you had a chance to look at it that is um, in this packet of information here so there has been uh, plenty of information shared and at this time I would open it up for discussion amongst trustees and we have Dr. Meyer here with questions for clarification on any of it um, so. Well, my only discussion point would be that we do some sort of hearing. I think there's enough evidence that, that question is suspect. So I mean, I can answer questions on why, but that's the start of my discussion. So my only district has really nothing to do with the scholarship process or anything well and, and from, actually from this yeah they they collect they put out the applications they collect them they give them to the organizations the organizations have their own pro external process of how they approve them then they give it back to us to have the scholarship night and we have the parents and the families come and then you know the community members from those organizations come up and give them Here's your award, we give you this much, and they give them to them. We host that, but we're not in charge of deciding who wins the scholarships. That's an external process with these scholarships. Just, what, just the middle person, basically. You just yeah, work. collect the scholarship, give it to the student. Yeah. And then we host the, the event to yeah. name yeah. the winners. And uh, so to prevent us from getting too much into the weeds, we won't be reviewing the scholarship process so much tonight, but asking ourselves the question of did a patron come forward with a complaint and concern did it adequately get answered or is there a need to take it a step further so it's sort of um keeping it at the 2000 you know 20,000 foot level and saying does this need further discussion or did the question get answered so that's what's in front of you and if you had a chance to look through the packet um, that would really help us here today. I think, oh, go ahead, Lonnie. No, no. I was just going to say, I think the bigger issue for me in this whole deal is that, yes, LBOSD is the middleman for a potential question that is 
if that question wasn't there, I would honestly have no problem being the middleman for that one, as long as, as well as all of them. But when you start asking questions, I feel like that, I think the patron has a point, especially with an organization that regularly reports to federal, federal agencies, and I, I feel like that can be proven. Uh, I, I don't love that, that that's on an LPOSD website, that question. So if, I mean, I know we're just the middleman and we didn't create the questions or the application, but in a way we are, I don't know, facilitating that question by letting students link it on our website, gathering it back. I think that question was there, I'd be fine with it, or it's, I don't know, completely independent of any of our servers. So I have, um, I would like to ask Dr. Meyer a question. How did you ask the Bonner County Human Rights Task Force this direct question that you received from the complainant? Yes, I sent it to them, and then I put in your packet what their response was. Okay. They just shred it. We do yeah, not. They do not. Share first they shred. shred. First they, they, they don't share with anyone outside of the scholarship committee, and then they shred the application. Which, it's, my opinion on this is, you know, we can ask whatever question we want of any group, and they answer that question. The, the, the answer that they gave us is an adequate answer to what we asked. I mean, on the county, yeah, exactly. Hey, do you do this? No, we don't, share, we don't share this information, and we shred everything. So, can you point me to their answer? The exact answer. Well, yeah, you'd have to go down in the emails. Because I'm pretty certain they didn't answer it with a yes or no, but, but I might have missed it. So. It says we did not share any information from the application to any organization or individual outside our special It's on page three of your packet, halfway down. Dear Dr. Meyer. was do you share this information with these entities so the, no we don't the board has two decisions here um, in policy 4110 um, we're we're asking ourselves if the superintendent addressed the concerns or complaint adequately that's option a option B is you can conduct a hearing on the matter if we feel it was not. So that's sort of Which, this this complaint. They've already answered whatever they would answer in any other format. It's directly to us, direct answer to the question. I mean, yeah. I mean, will the chair entertain a motion? Yes. I'd like to make a motion that the superintendent has adequately addressed the complaint, Hold on, be a complaint of the complainant and no further action is necessary. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, it's moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Yeah, I guess um, what, what would be the potential downfall of having a hearing about that question? Whether or not they answered it yes or no, my concern even beyond that is the question itself from a com an organization that is proven to do that. So to, to meet with them, they've reported churches in our area to the DOJ because they had a rally or a flyer that went out, um, political in nature. So like it's been proven that that organization does meet and report people and organizations for hate crimes um, that is a slippery slope then to let that question be in. So I guess whether they answered yes or no, it can be proven that they do that. But it's a parent choice. On, on a church? But it's a parent like, choice. Right. We're allowing our parents the choice and the decision for them and their families whether or not they participate. 
participate. So that's a whole different subject and a whole ball of wax. The question here, as far as I see it, is a question was asked. Dr. Meyer got the information. I think it was adequately responded to. I, I, I agree that there's a big, it's a big question and it's a big situation. I don't think that this, what we're asking and answering is was the specific question that was asked responded to appropriately. I think Dr. Meyer did, did the steps, followed the procedure, got the information, yeah. and had a response. Yeah, uh, I adequate? mean, that, yeah, you're right. On that, on that, that question, I, I mean, which is a bigger issue, but which is specifically right. so, the complaint. Like, yeah. We are addressing this complaint we have to address the, the, and got the sure. answers. Yeah. If it was I a different you. complaint that said we don't like X, Y, or Z, or we don't like this or this, that, that's not what we're talking about. Like, this is the complaint. We got the answer. <coughs> it's not up to us to challenge yes. them on their answer and say, well, you know, what are the next steps? In this what do you do with the threat? Like, they told us what they do with the information. Um, I feel like we're just caught in the middle of the whole yeah. thing right and, here. And we so. don't. Is there any, do the trustees want any uh, further input from Dr. Meyer or are you ready to, there's a motion on the table? Well, I'll just say before the motion, I'm going to vote no against this. Purely for the, the fact that I don't think the question should be there. Although I think the specific complaint and this as it is, is probably going to answer fine. Does that make sense? So I, I, I think I want to go on record and just say, you're saying. it doesn't make sense yeah. to me, but I understand. Yeah, yeah, it's tough for me because it's like, <laughs> to me it's a bigger question, but the specific complaint I think has been handled right. I got and, with, and answered, but I don't want to vote yes on this because I think there's a bigger, I don't know, how to, how to communicate that. I just want to go on record and say that before we vote. Okay. Is there any other information needed before we go to vote? In that case, I would ask for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Okay. Um, so that motion passes, and um, I would direct our clerk. It does say if the board finds that the superintendent has adequately addressed the concerns or complained of the complainant. Or that for any other reason, no further action is necessary, the board shall so inform the patron in writing. So that would be the next step. I appreciate the discussion on it. Those are not easy to wrangle with um, and to stay within the actual information there. Um, we have three school closure resolutions and they do need to be, I have to have a motion for each one of those to adopt those school closures. Uh, can we go? I make uh, a motion to adopt resolution 2401 school closure. I second that. It's moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Keep it rolling. I make a motion to adopt resolution 2402 school closure. I second that. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 That motion passes. And I make a motion to adopt resolution 2403, school closure. I second that. <laughs> All, any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those motions, that motion passes, wrapping up those three school closure motions. We have, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm losing my, I'm losing my voice. We have two second readings of policy. And um, the first is 2400 special education. And while you open it, you guys have Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Meyer, can you talk to So we had this we had this last time and there were no questions and follow up. No. Um, this is a short yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the vice chair could yeah. to adopt uh, <coughs> policy 2400 special education. I'll second that. Uh, 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 I'll second that. Uh
second. It's moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 That motion passes. The second uh, policy we're looking at for second reading is 2585, the use of therapy dogs <coughs> in the district. You recall we had a great discussion on that last time. Is there any? Uh, discussion now. Uh, I, I was, was this discussed in the January meeting? Yeah, last meeting. Okay. <coughs> uh, so I missed that. Was it like heated great discussion? Or no. no. Was there it was just interesting. It was just interesting. Okay. Yeah. How did it come to be, how did this policy come up? Is it, it's new, right? It's yeah. a new policy. And we had just had the opportunity to. We I wanted to make sure a policy was in place. We have Pepper that was at Farm and Stidwell was with Ellen, who was a counselor. She's now the assistant principal. Pepper's there, but other people have asked me, other schools have asked me about having therapy dogs. Um, we had this when I was in my last district. We put a policy in place. It, we're safer if we have a policy in place. They have to be certified. They have to go through all the certificates. And so I, did, I didn't want to, Pepper was already here before I came back. I didn't want to continue to add any therapy dogs without a policy in place that everyone could agree what the expectations were. And so Pepper is a therapy dog? Pe Pepper is a therapy dog at a boxer at, you've probably seen her picture before. Maybe. She reads with kids, she helps kids. Um, so Pepper and the handler. Her handler. And they meet all these yes. requirements. Yeah, she already was met him, but there was no policy in place. It happened before I came back. So when I was gone, the Pepper got into place. So, which has been a, okay. a very positive um, experience, which makes a, us inclined to have a policy in place in case anyone else does. Did I, maybe I missed it when I read the policy, is there any um, wording or verbiage about like frequency of it? Because it, could that be a slippery slope, like just therapy dogs every day becoming it's, a thing? No, it, it's, well, Pepper right now, just to give you the one example, She's at Farm and Stidwell every day, but she has to be with her handler. So if she was in the counseling office, she only goes into classrooms when she was going you know, to talk to the class or read to the class. Students that came in may read to the dog individually, but she's not, we, didn't, we don't have more than one dog at that school. It's intentional. Like it's not just the dog and the handler roaming around and saying, I, like it's very intentional. Sometimes. Could a teacher or a staff person become a handler they, in that They can apply time. to do that, but they have to go, they have to uh, talk to their principal about how that would be used, and then I have to approve it at the district level before we would approve the therapy dog. Okay. So even if they meet all the requirements, we still... Yeah, yeah, there's still... Still right. an opportunity to... Yes, to limit the number or say no, um, depending on the circumstances. And then, am I allowed to ask this or not? Did the patron public comment have anything to do or about have anything to do with this, or no, are we not able to that's discuss a, that? That's a different um, plan. Those are the stuffed stuff puppies that, that okay, okay. go through grant to little second graders as a as a reading not buddy. Like real puppies. Like yeah, not a therapy dog. I'm not. Which, okay. I'm not sure. I will have to ask the patron what. Yeah, sure. I'm guessing that because this is, because I would this like is to not it. Have a little bit of information before I finalize a vote on on this. If this has more to do that. that. This is a yeah, different this is different totally conversation. Just okay. Today. Yeah, we're not able to probably ask. No, but I can ask her after the meeting. Right. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but the, this is a very um, specific program. Okay. So, um, if there if there are no other questions, I will entertain a motion on this second reading. I make a motion to approve uh, policy two five eight five use of therapy dogs in the district. Is there any other discussion on it? All in favor? Aye. 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 That motion passes. So with that, we're through our action items on the agenda. And are there administrative announcements? Um, have a few other administrators here. John um, Crossing Hammond it, High School. It is CG Hema and yes. Jake Stark to <coughs> our Santa High School welding class to the regionals where they took Place. And um, Gavin Day took first place out of that group, and his mom was one of our CTE instructors for all publications. So it's a full circle, so it's very cool. Yep. Um, we, I feel like, sorry, I have to stand.
stand up, early stand up. We just did our mid-year kind of check-in and we made awesome academic growth, but I checked in with parents and a complaint or a feedback was to improve the end of the day at Washington Elementary because we're a town school and I knew I made it better, but I knew it could be even better, so I worked with Mr. Watkins, thank you, Jeff, for letting me have him. He's the crossing guard at Sandpoint High School and Sandpoint Middle School, and he is on it if you've never been there in the morning or after noon time. So he came and Officer Little and looked at the end of the day procedure and helped us, and we switched gears and implemented, well, they came on Wednesday and Thursday, and we tried it out on Friday, and we're moving forward and working out the kinks right now. And then Mrs. Caddick just took um, a group of 10 sixth graders to Spokane. I'm so proud of them. They, they were third in a math competition, which is amazing. Washington kids, and they, they, they practice on their own time after school. So those are the two kind of mid-year things at Washington. Great. Great. There, so we have, <coughs> Jeff Benner, a little more time. <laughs> what do you have? Oh, I just wanted to <coughs> say again about Thank you to Trustee Sherman for volunteering as a parent. Yeah. Take those kids in the math class out there <coughs> and kind of kick a butt. Good job. Um, and I also wanted to just thank the whole district team and Sandpoint High and everybody who jumped in today in a very, very difficult position. I think Dr. Meyer called me at what, 6.45 or so and said, yeah, half your school is unusable. And uh, mm -hmm. that is a situation that might crumble a lot of lesser staffs, but my staff just jumped up and, and took, it, took it to You're heart. You're getting used to it. You're getting good at it. <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh, they're like, oh yeah, or, well, it must be yeah. Tuesday. Yeah, I know. But no, they were, it, it, was, it was quite a challenging day, uh, but they really worked hard, and I really appreciate the parents who uh, left their kids all day, all day to, to let us learn. And we are really working hard as we go through these strange times, uh, you know, for the next two days, certainly, hopefully not much beyond. But if it does go beyond, um, we just really want to encourage the, the entire community to see attendance as still important even during weird times. So uh, <laughs> let's try and keep everybody coming to school. All right? All right Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for your voice, Mal. So, Summer Tiger, do you have anything yeah. to add? No, I got Phil, oh, sorry. Oh. No? I have a couple of guys, but I do want to say thank you very much for approving the, the small white buses. Um, it's we're going to have to save for real fast. Right now, we are looking at just at Clark Fork alone, uh, the safest three uh, big buses going down south. And so, and it makes it much nicer too. I just got back from a call driving in, and uh, McCall isn't a very big town, and I don't know how well one of those really huge buses would have got around McCall. And when you, when it's you say tight. Big, big, it's super tight. You guys, when you say big, huge buses, these are the charter buses, yeah, the right. average cost for those oh. is $10,000 right now. Yeah. It just breaks my heart. For That's trip. Yeah. For one for trip. trip. You'll make it up and it's no nice. yeah. It's really Three trips. On top of that, you have to pay for drivers and elders and stuff. Uh, like for us, a day early. And so we usually pull ours out of Montana. And so luckily, um, well, it, yeah. it, it's been a blessing for our school. It's been it's really great. nice. I'm really happy we got that second one. And um, yeah, hopefully we can see a third. So. And they're small enough, you don't have to have a CDL. You can, right. You're driving them yourself, yeah. right? Or, <laughs> or the coaches or whoever. Yeah, that's absolutely yeah. right. And um, it, you can talk about connecting with kids and stuff. It absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> jump, jump, jump in a van with them. Woo! <laughs> 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 Good job. <laughs> uh, oh, and then the other thing I want to talk about being CTE month. Um, there's it started last year, but it's called the Avista Graph Program. I don't know if anybody's heard about it, but it's a pretty unique opportunity. We have three kids. Avista, these three kids are going to go tour the local dams, and Avista is, they're going to open up a spot for a kid, and it might be from our school, it might be from another small school, I know they, they go and they use it and stuff, but it will create an internship opportunity for a student, and the average salary across the U.S. right now for like power type people is around 24 bucks an hour, and Avista actually, their average salary is higher, and off the charts and so we've got some kids who they don't want to go to college but they are definitely hands-on and um i think there's across the one specifically because um just knowing him he's got a great work ethic and if he can actually make it through it it's like a professional interview process the whole works um, we had some kids apply last year and 
didn't make it, I hope the state of this year makes it because it would be an outstanding opportunity making them some sort of a six figure income. And keep us posted on awesome. that. Yeah, yeah. So it's great. Awesome. Is there any announcements from the admin team? We heard a little bit from each of you already. No, Thank you. We're good. Nothing Thanks. else? Nothing else? Dr. Meyer? No, I'm great. With that, meeting adjourned. <laughs>